Hi, and welcome along. Hi, it's Kathy Bray here from IMCO, from the International Integrative Maternity Healthcare Organization. And welcome along today uh, to this in, um, Maternity Natural Health webinar. And very uh, pleased to uh, welcome along today from Canada, uh, Nigerian Adiola. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it is wonderful to have you here today. And uh, Eziola has uh, been a registered nurse uh, since uh, 2010 in Nigeria before she relocated to Canada. Um, and uh, so that's what a dozen years ago you came to Canada. So uh, that's uh, that's been a while ago. Quite a journey for you going from Africa to North America. And... Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to let her uh, introduce herself to you and sort of explain her background. But the commentary today is particularly around perinatal mental health issues. And uh, boy, that is uh, quite the journey. I know that there's oftentimes talk around the place of saying when we talk about postnatal depression, uh, people say it's, you know, one in four, this type of thing. I would have to say I disagree. And in the front line, I think it's more like one in three. Um, but, you know, oftentimes women are perhaps uh, mild enough that they make the decision mm -hmm. that they're not going to be going out there and getting diagnosed and, and becoming part of the statistics. But I think that certainly bouts of sometimes quite debilitating depression in that postnatal period would happen to probably about one in three women. It's pretty common, pretty up there. And I would say in my observation, uh, it tends to be particularly dominant in Europeans and Caucasians. And I, I think that from what I see, it's because there is just not necessarily the same level of um, extended family around a lot of the times. Um, uh, certainly in my practice, you know, probably about 50% of my clients were Asian or Indian. And those extended families are nearly always there. And although they sometimes drive everybody a little batty <laughs> as well, <laughs> particularly, and I, I will uh, very much generalize here when I say that the Indian or the Chinese mother-in-law could be sometimes a little bit too much but at the same time you know that those women are being very weighted on and very put on a pedestal and looked after and uh whereas we you know we'd often see our european woman just disappear into loneliness with their girlfriends all back at work and probably their mother back at work and their mother-in-law at work and and or in different cities and a lot of isolation going on there um so it's a really big issue isn't it it's a very big issue in the community um and in our society so the format today with um Adiolo, she's going to got a powerpoint there that she's going to go through and uh, uh obviously if it, we know a lot of you watch this later down the track but for those of you who are live if you want to put in any questions for her, please do put them into the Q&A or the chat. We'll absolutely make sure that they get um, addressed before things end. And uh, so Adiola may be talking for about half an hour or so, um, maybe 40 minutes, and but plenty of time, and we'll certainly have things wound up within an hour. Um, so welcome, and I'll hand you over. Okay, um, good afternoon, good morning, depending on which part of the world you are in. It's afternoon for me here in Canada. So my name is Adeola Folorushiro. I'm originally from Nigeria, but I've lived in Canada over 12 years. I did all my education, both my undergrad and master's in Canada. I'm a registered nurse and I've been practicing nursing well over 13 years and I've practiced nursing in different domains of nursing, be it education, research, um, teaching and administration. And um, today this topic is very dear to me just because sometimes in September, I organize a summit around something like this and I could observe myself and uh, even with other people's experiences, what people are going through when it comes to 
um, the dear topic that I have before us. So my question to the audience is, have you ever wondered, despite there are a lot of activities, a lot of programs out there, and still we still have high level of perinatal mental health issues? So this is not a matter of there are no programs, this is not a matter of there are no funding, but yet we still have a high number of perinatal mental health issues. Have you ever wondered why that is? So that all shares me to this, today's topic um, on perinatal mental um, issues. It is a unique journey indeed. And I'm gonna be sharing my slide. Can you all see my slide? Yep, that looks great. I know it's not the full slide, but it's all fine. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying not to go to the full slide because of the obvious reasons you know where we're, <laughs> right? So like I said, my name is Adiola and then we'll be discussing on the topic today, perinatal mental health issues, the unique journey. Okay, so now, from the picture, what can you all see? Every picture tells a story. And what can you see from the picture? Kathy, are people going to be responding or it's just me talking all through for the 30 minutes? Um, it depends. I think a lot of times people are watching while they're or listening, while they're driving and doing okay. other things. So, perfect. Uh, yeah, they, they okay. sometimes. There's a okay, perfect. So like I said, every picture tells a story. And as we all know that a picture is worth a thousand words. In this picture, you can see women from different racial background. You can see women from different class, meaning women from different social status. Now, you, if you look closely, you can see, um, let me try to annotate here. Um, you can see um, this lady right here. If anybody know who she is, that is the daughter of the former president of United States. If I can draw. Right here, you can see this beautiful lady right here, and that is Meghan Markle. And right here also, you can see this very popular lady, and that is Serena Williams. And right here, you can see a, a woman from Africa, a woman from India, right here. Uh, you can see even a man in this picture with a wife, with his wife, rather. You can see a woman from a, uh, with a, you know, Caucasian. You can see a lady from um, a Chinese lady. And you can even see a father who is not even looking very happy. This picture tells us a lot of things that what we're about to discuss here today does not just affect only one particular race. It is a global concern that nobody is immune to this if we do not take the necessary intervention. So it has no respect for social uh, for social status. It has no respect for race. It has no respect for any social health determinant if the appropriate measures are not put in place. So from the picture, you could tell that it affects everyone. Okay. Now I'm gonna move to the next slide. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so according to uh, World Health Organization in 2022, they said one in five women experience mental health, uh, mental health conditions during pregnancy and post-delivery. And sadly enough, over 20% of these women are at higher risk of suicidal ideation and committing suicide. Although there have been a lot of, like uh, uh, Elias said, that there are a lot of initiative worldwide, but we continue to see the rise we continue to see new cases, which is the incidence. We continue to see that the total number of cases, uh, total number of women experiencing, um, be it baby blues, be it postpartum depression, be it uh, uh, preparious psychosis, or be it a uh, suicide, is on the rise among this particular set of people, despite there are a lot of 
information, despite there are a lot of um, activities, there's a, despite there are a lot of community programs out there. But the question is, why? Why do we experience that? Despite there are a lot of measures in place. There is a particular video, I hope this video plays, yeah. I'm gonna play this video and then uh, let's see. A local police officer is raising the alarm about Are you able to hear the video after tragedy hit his family. His wife died by suicide just oh. over a week ago following the birth of their twins. And we understand this is a very difficult story to hear, but he tells Boston 25 news reporter Katie Race he wants more to be done to alert and educate families. Easton police officer Tyler Sutton saves people's lives for a living. He's now sharing his own pain of suddenly losing his wife in hopes of helping others. Ready? Ariana Sutton proudly showing her young daughter their newborn twins. This video was taken on the family's last day together. Nine days after Everly and Rowan were born prematurely, Ariana took her own life. A week and a half after her death, Tyler Sutton copes with his grief by talking about his wife's pain. Get more people to focus on it and recognize that it's a real problem and that it hasn't been talked about enough. Behind her smile, Ariana dealt with postpartum depression. So odd to see this sudden change and it was noticeable, but like I said, her, we had a plan. So I will stop the video right there. So. Um, Katy, I want to believe that you were able to hear the sound. Yes, we could. Perfect. So from this video, you could see that behind the smile, that's what the video said, behind the smile, there was a woman who gave birth and took a life two weeks after and left the family to this. So to just let us know that every of these mental health issues that is experienced by women Post delivery would not only affect the woman; it's a it's a global thing. It affects the family in totality. It affects the community. It affects the society, and so it is a big deal. I know they said it's one in five. I would believe it's going to be one in one because probably this thing is underreported, or there are not enough data to support that. But I know that it is on the rise despite that. So this is in the Western world. And now let's go what let, let's see what's going in Africa. Because, like I said, just to portray the point that this is a global problem. <laughs> so it was when I got pregnant that everything just changed. I started asking questions around. And this is Nigeria for I started to just let you know. Secret because there was nothing else I could do. I needed something to enter my head. I needed somebody to talk to me. When I went to my labor pain, I didn't even touch my child because I was really angry at the child that, ah, oh, you made me go through so much stress. I actually hated my child. Strong woman, be strong. Don't cry. Hey, they said this word. And I'm crying, my baby, and I'm crying. My uncle, my uncle, my Ah, Koda, Nile Yoruba, when you come on, you come on, come on, you all of those things, they'll be saying it, I'm like, allow me to express myself. In the time when I was feeling sad, um, the only time I remember looking at my child and wanting to take out my frustration and him was when I thought I could just smash this little thing on the wall and explain it away, oh, the baby just, you know, isn't moving, I don't know what happened. Sena ka mo re chiu, nda ba nda lai pi awan sang kai na wo kuma da ka ba si na zo na si na ka ka mo ba da na ba ni wa. Si na ke jeng hao shen shi, mo jeng ma in ya zo ku sa ni si na jeng hao shen shi. Ba na sang ka nong ku ha ma ma na ma si na jeng ba na sang ka ninta. You know, and I always felt like, oh, the father can never like love the child the way the mother loves the child. So sometimes when I even see him, or when, maybe when he's going out, normal, he wants to go out. It'd be paining me inside, like, where are you going to? Where do you want to go to? You know. So I wasn't able to pay more attention to whatever he's saying. If he comes and tells me things, I'll just be like, oh, 
Okay, let's go. Okay. So we've looked at what happened in the Western and, and I brought it down to Africa and this is specifically Nigeria. And the people you saw in the picture are people from, because in Nigeria we have different tribal groups of people. So these are people from different parts. We have the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Aousers, you know, up, across Nigeria. These are people well represented to just let you know that it is something that affects everyone, every woman, irrespective of your social determinants of health, irrespective of your social status, and irrespective of your location or your geographical location. As long as you are a woman, this can happen to anyone. But the problem is there are a lot of measures in place, but these things keep rising. And so a lot of people, when they undergo these things, from the video, you could hear one of the ladies saying that they've told her she cannot even cry during that period. You are not expected to cry. You are not expected to. Uh, one of them even said she she was willing to even throw the baby away just to eat the baby's head on the on the wall. You know, emotions like that. But yet they are not ex accepted or they are not allowed to express that emotion. They are supposed to suppress that emotion because the society does not want to see that aspect of a woman to express emotion post delivery. And now this is the most, the sad one of it. Let's look, take a look. <laughs> So unfortunately, from that video, the baby passed away. That little newborn did not make it. The mom had the baby, and this happened in September of this year. Still very fresh. The mom, the young lady, took the baby, uh, the newborn, and threw the baby into the river. And everybody, I didn't have the full, I didn't get, I didn't put the full video here because of time. And everybody was blaming her that why would she do that? She was beaten by the when the men you could see in those videos that they were beaten. But if you notice something, it was still the men that came around to, to rescue the child. That to tell us that when the woman is going through that phase, it is everybody's business. It is not going to be only the woman that's going to bring herself out of it. It was the men that came around to rescue that baby. But unfortunately, the baby did not make it. So it is that bad that this thing called postpartum depression, baby blues, post, um, the preparer psychosis, you know, it's very, it's something very serious that we need to start taking very serious and very personal so that interventions can be um, applied to. But the thing though is that there's a lot of misconception. But before the misconception, I will share some data, some statistics with us. They have said that one in five women will suffer from perinatal mental health issues. And less than 15% of these women will receive treatment. Do you have to ask yourself why? Why would only 15% of the women out of the 100 number of people that are gonna be experiencing this, why will only 15% will receive treatment? What happened? Is it because it's not, the treatment is not accessible? Is it because they cannot fund it? Is it because they cannot afford it or there is no funding? I think it's a question that we should ask ourselves that only 15%, then what happened to the 75%? That is going to increase the number. You see where the number is, why we continue to have the increase in the number of, um, you know, perinatal mental health issues in women globally. And sad enough, 50% of women living in poverty 
should be prepared to experience perinatal mental health issues. 50%. That is a high number of people, um, a number of women to be expecting that. Because 50% is half of a woman, uh, the, the population globally should be expected if they're undergoing, if they're experiencing poverty. So we could see the impact of the social determinants of health on our mental wellness in the women. So, and we know that when it comes to social determinants of health, it has a lot of historical, political um, undertone to it. And it's something that it's been there for long. And unfortunately, is it getting better? I don't know. Do you know? It's a question that we should ask ourselves because it's not just about the social determinants of health. What about the impact of social determinants of health on women that do not have access to appropriate care such that in the long run, it is affecting their mental health post-delivery and even during the pregnancy. And then you see one very um, important graph that I have here. Uh, you see that Asian, Asian countries are doing so well 7.4%, that's the percentage. And the question is, why are they doing better than the Americans, you know, the Caucasian, even the black uh, countries are not even doing well at all. The postpartum depression in new mothers by ethnicity, this is what this graph is all about. And you could see that the black, you know, white Caucasians are not doing well, but Asia is doing well. But I asked myself, and it's a question we should ask ourselves, what is Asian, what, what are they doing differently that other countries are not tapping into? Or could it be that these numbers are not, you know, they're not, it's underly reported or there is no, they are underdiagnosed. Who knows? These are questions that we should ask ourselves because we cannot afford to continue to do things the way we used to do. We need to act fast because this is taking or killing our women globally, irrespective of their social status. And then, like I defined earlier on that perinatal mental health problem are just those, you know, things that occur during pregnancy and even after first year following the birth of the child. And this could manifest physically, socially, and emotionally. And it does impact the overall quality of life of the mom and not just the mom. So the succession goes on and it goes on and on like that. It would affect the interaction with the baby. It would affect the family. And then it would affect the society as a whole, irrespective of where they are socially, geographically, or financially. It will affect them. Now, there's a lot of misconception about people, you know, you know, just interchange words. Some will call it baby blues. Some will say it's postpartum depression. Some will say it's psychosis, uh, postpartum psychosis. What exactly is it? So I decided to make a graph out of this and put a color code to that. And I want to let us know that as we go from one color to the other, the severity increases. The severity is on the rise. So from conception, which is green, very good. And then now baby blues. And this normally happens after about a week or five days or maximum a week, you know, post delivery. And then what you see in the woman is the uh, mood swing. You know, she could be happy today and sad tomorrow. A lot of crying spell, crying for no reason, overwhelmed, just disturbed about so many things and insomnia, in, 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 uh, unable to sleep. So that's kind of like very subtle. It's not very subtle. You can see when the green is not greening anymore. <laughs> the, 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 the thickness of the green is beginning to fade away. And that's where the, the baby blue start. And it's very subtle. And now... When we go down the arrow, you realize that it then leads to postpartum depression. And as you go down the arrow, the severity increases, like I earlier said. If you do not take intervention, then how can you even take in the intervention when you don't even know what it is, when you cannot even recognize it, when the society is asking you not to talk about it, when people have already stigmatized you, when you live in a country where they will not allow you to express your feeling, you are going to suppress that. So you suppress it or you don't even know what it looks like. And if you don't know what it looks like when it starts as a baby blues, it leads to postpartum depression. And that's going to be more severe. Severe mood swing, lack of interest, hopelessness, anger, panic attack. 
you know, guilt, restlessness. Why did I have this baby? You know, like, oh, like, um, I'm not supposed to do this. You just blame yourself for everything. Fatigue, brain fog. You can't even remember things. You're getting confused. And then you're moving towards the, the yellow zone or the orange zone, which is the postpartum psychosis. Full blow right there. And then you begin to hallucinate. Hallucination could come of auditory where you begin to hear stuff that is not there, that is only heard by you, but not heard by others. You begin to see things that's the visual hallucination. You begin to have gustatory hallucination. Maybe things is moving all over you. So you're entering the psychotic phase of postpartum feeling, um, uh, you know, experience. And you begin to lose yourself. You begin to even, like from the, from the video that we watched, the very last video, you could see the lady, she was already in the psychotic phase she took a baby, a, a few old baby, threw the baby into the river, you know? And then if that is not also taken care of, it leads to suicidal ideation where people just kill themselves. And unfortunately, it sat very subtle, but it does now lead to postpartum suicide or death. I hope none of us or none of our women get to that phase, but we hope that things can be done appropriately. Now, the question is, Adiola, you've been saying this, you've been saying that. What, where are people experiencing this? What, what's causing this? And what I found out from people experiences as a nurse, even as a mom myself, and I haven't lived in different, um, two different countries, and this is what I've seen. And everything you see on the slides are not my words. They are words coming from people that have experienced it. One said, I have it because I don't have much support. And that happens a lot, especially when you're in a Western world, when you don't have support system, when you just, you're by yourself, you know, and it's common among sometimes immigrants where we just, myself, my husband, and that's it. When you don't have your in-laws here to help you, or you don't have a good rapport with your in-laws, or you don't have good relationship with friends around and things like that, or you, maybe your personality, you're just very the quiet one. And then came pregnancy and then came delivery, but you don't have a social support system. Another said, my recovery took longer than expected. The recovery phase took longer than expected. So the, ex the, the, the societal expectation is that after pregnancy, you are supposed to get back to shape. You know, you're supposed to get back to the way you were pre-pregnancy. And then you are kind of like pressurized. And then that kind of make you feel, you begin to have low self-esteem of yourself and that begins to affect your mental health. And then another one said, I have experienced abused. So it is sometimes all these things does not just happen during pregnancy. These are pre things that happen before. And if they're not handled, they're just soft to sitting right there. And if they're not well handled, it could affect and even make postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis very prominent. Another one said, I just broke up. You can imagine somebody who just, who just had a baby and then undergoing divorce. That's a whole lot to handle. That's too much. And some said, I stopped taking my medication. With that, I was so concerned. Why, why did you stop your medication? Could it be funding? Could it be that you don't have access to that? Or could it just be that I lack interest? You know, like I mentioned that these are some of the things that, you know, could cause that, you know, postpartum depression. It could lead to even uh, psychosis and all that. And said, I recently lost the family. So stress could lead to that. Societal expectation of you. And then, you know, um, I had previous emotional problems. So these are things, and I, I, I intentionally brought all this so that we could see this, all these people's voices together. And some even said financial, you know, you're having a baby, financially, you are not even prepared. Maybe you just, it was an unplanned pregnancy. You're not financially prepared for that. And guess what? Who's going to suffer it the most? It's the women. The, the society will blame you, number one, for being um, teenage pregnancy or planned pregnancy and then come no finance, no, no financial support. That's going to just compound the whole thing and make the whole thing complicated and the woman just lose herself. And then stigma as well. You could see from the video as well. You are not allowed to talk. Even when you're experiencing all these feelings, you better keep quiet. You better don't say anything because if you say something, they're going to call you names. You're going to get some derogatory names. Oh, she's like, I'm from Nigeria, for instance. Sometimes we have those thick 
you know, local names that we give to people that undergo mental health problems. And nobody wants to associate themselves with those names. So they would rather just what? Go mute. And they just keep quiet because they don't want to be identified at the detriment of their own health because they don't want to be stigmatized. Now, if you see this whole thing, you realize that, and sometimes it's hormones too. It could be the pregnancy hormone could be right there and you're trying to recover, you know, you know, the level of the hormones are getting, you know, have to go back to the normal and all that. But if you look at everything all compounded, everything to place together, you realize that it does not just happen in, pre in um, you know, after pregnancy. It does not ha just happen during pregnancy. Sometimes it is before pregnancy. And you will see why I'm so keen about when this thing starts. So people will just think it's only after pregnancy. People need to start to be screened. Women need to be screened. Women of childbearing age needs to be screened pre-pregnancy to be able to know who are the people that are prone or at higher risk of having postpartum um, depression or having baby blues so that they don't get into the postpartum depression uh, depressive states so we want to focus on the before doing and after with the hope that when we focus on the before then there might not be a doing or we might not even get to the after phase you know because we know that it could get worse if things are not um, put in place now this is very interesting there are so many myths around postpartum depressions, psychosis, even baby blues as subtle as it is. And there's some, some cultural things that do affect people. Number one myth there, right there is, um, sorry about the circle you're seeing on my slide because that was from the annotation from the first one. Number one myth is only women experience uh, prenatal mental health challenges. Is that true? I don't think so. I did a lot of findings I've experienced men, and in fact, sometimes it used to be one in 10 dads struggle with postpartum depression and anxiety. And you know what they do? How you get to know? They begin to engage in habits that they've never en uh, engaged in before. Some will go into a lot of smoking, drinking, beating up their wives, doing things that normally you will never find them do. I know the number says one in 10. A recent re a reliable research finding says one in four, one in four dads will struggle with postpartum depression. But because it is just limited to like, everybody just say women, when we talk about postpartum depression, the next thing that comes to our head is women. No, that is, that is a scam. That's a mental scam. You know, everybody could be, it, it has no respect for any gender. Then number two is, only moms, only new moms or new dads have postpartum depression. That's not true. So you could you could scale through it the first time in your first pregnancy, and then it could decide to come in the second pregnancy or third pregnancy or even the last pregnancy, depending on your state of, of your body before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after pregnancy. If all those aforementioned causes are found in you, there is tendency that you are prone to it. So people always think if it happens in your second uh, pregnancy, they don't think towards that line that it could be postpartum depression or it could be baby blues that is very subtle. No, so it could be any time of the pregnancy. And they will say postpartum depression will go away over time. It will not go away. If you don't do anything to it, if you don't act on it, if you don't intervene, it will stay and it's be well pronounced to the extent of that person could take his or her life. So it will not go away. <laughs> it's very stubborn. It's one of the stubborn mental issues that people don't see. You know, the physical you can see, the mental one kills faster, right? So it will not go away if things are not you know, in place. And the, the third one is the symptoms are the same for everyone. And I'll call after delivery. No, it is very unique. The way it happened to my neighbor will be different for it is going to happen to the next door neighbor, to the next door, uh, uh, to the next woman. It would not be the same thing. So don't be looking for the same signs and symptoms. There could be some commonalities, you know, you know, but let's take individually. Let's see them individually. Let's treat the people individually, that this is a unique journey and the way they're going to experience it, the way it's going to present 
will be unique. And that's why as healthcare providers, or even as friends, families, we should be aware of what it looks like. And then we should not use the, the mentality of one size fits all. It doesn't work that way. One size fits all does not work that way. It is a unique journey. And then, and they said that it occurs immediately after delivery. No, some, it might just be after one year, it could kick in. Like I said, it does not, it doesn't just start in one day. It's a cumulative effect of something sitting very subtle. And that if that thing is not taken away, which is stressor, it's going to be blown out. Well pronounced. And then the fourth one is experiencing postpartum depression shows that I'm a bad mom and a weak parent. We've heard a whole lot of this thing. And that ties to the cultural aspect. You know, some think it's a way that God has come to offend, uh, you know, God has come to, it's because I've offended God, you know, and God has come to take revenge on me, you know, depending on the cultural belief, you know, culture is the way of life, they say. And we so much believe in our culture. We, we hold our culture in high esteem and value. And so pe some people believe that when they experience this moment, this feeling, it's because God is punishing them. No, we need to educate people that it has nothing to do with God or your behavior. These, it's just simply there are some stressors that are in there that just need to be taken away. If that could be addressed, then it has nothing to do with your spirituality. It has nothing to do with how worthy you are. It is simply something that you can handle if you can recognize it. If you don't recognize it, then there is no help. There's no how you can identify, if you cannot identify it. So it is not that if you experience that, that is not a reflection of uh, who you are in terms of your morals, in terms of your spirituality to God. And, and I want to address more on that when it comes to, it's because I've offended God. You know, there are times where there'll be like teenage pregnancy or maybe, you know, you got pregnant for somebody else's husband. You know, I'm going to use that as a case study. It happens so, so much in most of um, low income countries where, you know, like, you know, somebody got pregnant for another man's husband and then this happened after delivery. And then the society will say, yeah, that's it. This is the punishment. This is the reward for taking somebody else's husband. This is what you're going to get from it. You see how nature, you see how mother nature is working out its thing. No, this is not a matter of mother nature. This is just something that anybody could be prone to irrespective of where you belong or whatever you do. So simply, it has nothing to do with your sad, uh, with your with your morals. It has nothing to do with what you did, but you can you can manage that by identifying what the stressors are. So those are kind of like some of the myths that it's very like well-believed and people took in very high esteem. And then now that I've said all this, okay, Adela, you have said all this, you have said that. So what can we do? So number one thing is that if, you, if you've if you been following so well, number one thing is that people should be able to recognize it. You know, um, family, friends, if you have a friend who is pregnant or, you know, be on the lookout for them. It, it, it is a collective effort. So people should be able to, um, you know, be able to recognize what it looks like. It doesn't look like one particular thing, but you can begin to connect the dots when you begin to see the shift in the behavior of that person, you can begin to connect the door. You be, continue to see, okay, something is changing about this person and it doesn't have to be women alone. Men are also involved. So this, this is, this is the message I really want to put out there that it's not just the men, women thing. The men are also not left out. So number one is creation of awareness, you know, by and and, 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 also an, an enabling environment where people are allowed to talk about it. Let's reduce the stigma. The stigma is so much that people don't want to talk about it because they don't want to be stigmatized that, oh, I'm having a mental health issue. Nobody wants to identify with it. So let's create the environment where it is enabling for people to be able to talk about it. And that could be through social media. The power of social media these days is very phenomenal. Let's take advantage of social media to create the awareness that postpartum depression or baby blues or puperial psychosis, it's real. Some people don't even believe it exists. That's one problem too. It's real. It could affect anybody. And then number two is ability to recognize the symptoms using culturally appropriate screening tools. And I'm very specific about the culturally appropriate screening tools that, because the tools that I, we use in Africa might not be too effective 
in the in, in the Western world or the one in Western world. So we need to kind of adapt those tools to be able to suit the geographical location, to be able to identify that. And I know the most popular one is the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale or even the patient health questionnaire. You know, but it could be modified to suit the the culture or to suit the people. And why are we doing that? Why are we why are we you know getting those data? Why are we collecting those data? It's because it could be useful for the public health experts. They, they will get those information, utilize those information to be able for for proper program planning to put the planning in place, to put those health education in place, to put the information out there, to foster research, to be able to inform policies, to be able to improve the intervention given to different women or men or family or society that postpartum depression or preparer psychosis is real and but these are the measures in place. So if we don't have numbers, if we don't have figures, what are we going to act on is the question. So we need those things to be able to recognize them and be able to use those data as well. And also strengthen access to affordable mental, uh, maternal mental programs and user-friendly technology. So I said affordable. So there could be programs, but are they accessible? Are they affordable? Are they user-friendly? You know, it could be complicated. We all know that sometimes the healthcare system could be very, very complicated to navigate, you know. So we want to put a system in place that people can easily assess, irrespective of your educational status, irrespective of who you are, you are able to assess those um, interventions, those programs on time. In fact, one way that was just actually coming to my head was, you know how we have the phone with us. And then there's a lot of people have different apps. You know, there's a lot of apps on the phone. Can we even have a app on our phone that, you know, the app that will just be like post, uh, postnatal screening, where you just press this, a series of questions you can ask. And then, you know, when you're done answering those questions, the data is transmitted to the 1 800 number, to the, you know, service line number that people can assess without the next person next to you, knowing that this is what you have just done without you announcing what you've just done. So things like that, we can bring it home, we can bring it closer, we can bring it more friendly. We can utilize the power of uh, info, uh, uh, technology at this time to be able to address postpartum depression in a prompt approach. And then quality antenatal and uh, anti-intra and postnatal services. We need those quality. I think it's about time the quality, the, the services that we render in the antenatal and the intra and postnatal services has to be strengthened, you know, because these are moments we, can, we should be screening people for doing that. And there are a lot of resources out there. There are a lot of organizations out there that they go into the communities, the local communities, to be able to render those services to people, to start screening them from the onset even before it's a full blown um, you know, experience. And then more importantly, it will be a discipline, an interdisciplinary collaboration where we have between the medical and the non-medical personnel, where they come together to be able to address, you know, this, this, this major um mental health issues that is affecting our women and men and the society as a whole. And when I say non-medical, it could be a religious leader. These are change agents. It could be community leaders. They could take that opportunity to preach about that in the church, in the mosque, or wherever you, or whatever religion you practice. Leaders of those, you know, institution can take charge of that. So that's why I said it's not just for the medical alone. It is something that affects the physical, mental, social, and uh, spiritual aspect. Those major four domains of women or or, or you know, everyone generally needs to be involved. And then more importantly, what is the essence of doing community programs when there is no follow-up? How do we know that the people that we saved two days ago or three weeks ago are still on track? So there is, we need to strengthen that opportunity to, to do that. So in a nutshell, it is something that it's everybody's business. Like I said, we should be able to identify what it looks like Um, just you know, be on the lookout for. And then more importantly, there's an aspect called the psychotherapy to can be utilized to, for anybody who is undergoing that, more of the cognitive behavioral therapy where, you know, the woman or the man will be the one to identify what he or she is undergoing. And at the same time, questions will be asked 
to be able to let that, that person know that if what you're feeling is it appropriate is it is it right you know you bring that to their consciousness and through that it's been very helpful whereby people know that this what they're feeling is not it's it's kind of a you know pointing towards the negative or the danger zone or the red zone which is suicidal or uh, or death you know and then Compliance with medication, which is so important. So sometimes in August 4 of this year, August 4 this year, FDA re uh, released a medication, uh, approved of a medication rather called the Zoranolone. Um, it's a medication and it's first of its kind for postpartum depression. Just in August fourth of this year, in the, the FDA released that. But so when I when when um you know it was it was an exciting um you know exciting news everywhere in in the United States. People were so happy that yeah this is good because a lot of people have been pushing for that. And then guess what? When you look at the mechanism of action of the drug, it's doing what it's supposed to do. But when you look at the side effects, <laughs> while we are making solutions to one side, this drug is causing problem in another in another area. And what are those things? It causes confusion. <laughs> one of the side effects is confusion. Another one is drowsiness. Another one is forgetfulness. <laughs> so the most important thing is that, can we try non-pharmacological approach? Let's try non-pharmacological approach that is mentioned above, like I mentioned above, by looking out for one another, creating more community programs, identifying that screening, let's strengthen our screening such that we don't want to lean towards more of the pharmacological approach where it could be creating some signs and symptoms that we have to deal be dealing with that separately. And then finally, my take home would be, it is okay to ask for support promptly. It is not a sign of weakness. I know some culture, when we ask for, um, you know, when we ask for help, we think we are weak. I'm not a good mom. I'm not a weak, I'm not a strong mom. I'm not a super mom. No, please. It is okay to ask for help because in asking for help is wisdom and strength. And perinatal mental health requires collective effort, like I earlier said. So it's everybody's business, no race, no social status, no gender is exempted. It's everybody's business. And then we should be able to recognize that immediately and also join the support group that people can, you know, talk about it. It's open discussion and nobody's shy to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> oh, that was so great. Thank you so much, Aziola. It's just wonderful listening. And, you know, it is, gosh, isn't it just such a universal global issue? You know, as you say, it just doesn't matter where you are in the world that's there. But I did find that interesting, your little bar graph that showed Asians being the lowest rate, which was just kind of coincidental to my comment at the beginning that, you know, 50% of my clients were Asian and Indian. And I, I definitely noticed what I saw was seemed to be lower rates, you know, um, as a as a midwife, you know, we tend to sort of um, wind up our care, you know, in that newborn period. So we're, we're discharging the woman out of our care at, you know, day at, at week four or week five, week six sort of thing um, in the postpartum. So, you know, often there's, you know, postnatal depression is really happening further later down the track. But you, mm -hmm. you can sort of see it from the get go, you know, you can you can see those little red flags um, oftentimes and you just know that that woman is already in places of anxiety and stress and worry that are just not in that healthy level and not feeling supported and such a massive uh, debilitating uh, thing of women not wanting to fess up to their feelings because of mm -hmm. how that could get perceived, how that could get treated, how people could react to them. You know, that um, weakness, aren't coping kind of thing where in my experience, most of the time, it is so often uh, a vicious cycle between what the lack of sleep is doing and the increased worries of just looking after a new human being. Um, and, you know, you combine that all with the 
uh, how that will upset the, you know, melatonin and cortisol levels and everything else that happens. And it's almost like, how can they not get depressed? You know, <laughs> how can you <laughs> put a woman through all it, especially, especially, mm -hmm. you know, if their birth was not how they hoped it was going to be. And, you know, we are oftentimes around the world, you know, with the C-section rates are, are pretty commonly sitting around 35%. You know, sometimes it's lower, often it's higher. And that doesn't even include the instrumental delivery rates, one, two, mm -hmm. and four sips. And on top of that, we know that women who are having first babies are higher percentages of those um, interventions. Um, so, you know, what we're, we're probably thinking that most women would have a, you know, a less than 50% chance of having a normal birth a normal first birth and I don't mm -hmm. think that you know most women go into labor realizing that that's their statistics um mm -hmm. depending on how medicalized their obstetrician is depending on the culture of those hospitals so you know they come away from uh something that may have been pretty emotionally uh um traumatic and dramatic and and you know it's you put them then you sleep deprive them for a month and maybe they're getting over the major abdominal surgery and you oh these things like like I sometimes I just look back and go how did they not get depressed you know <laughs> it's kind of miraculous the ones that don't sometimes um so it is it is this kind of crazy crazy situation that um. Uh, EP EPDS, the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale Screening Tool. That's a great little screening tool, isn't it? And I know yeah. of um, some chains of uh, MDGPs um, in some places where they have made that part of the um, process of when women are coming in typically say at around six weeks for their baby to have its first vaccines uh, and while they're sitting in the waiting room after the baby's had the shot so you know you're sitting there for half an hour making sure there's no you know unusual um you know anaphylactic reaction or anything and they're said hey you know how about you sit down and complete this questionnaire and mm -hmm. you know it's 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 a clever questionnaire because i don't think that it gives away much of what it's really doing but it's so effective mm -hmm. in its questions you know hey in the last seven days have you felt this way um and uh so if you found that uh tool is as useful in countries that are not english speaking you know is it being translated quite well does it work still quite well yes that's why i said the um it has to be culturally channeled to uh, the okay. country. Yeah, yeah. it is has it, to be. Is like, it being, but is that being mm -hmm. done effectively with that questionnaire? So, so what they do is just that they just, um, you know, it will be similar to the overall theme, but they just modify to suit, um, be it language, the language be, you know, translated. So it's it's a whole lot of series of process, but at the same time, not losing the 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 main goal for for gathering those information. Yeah. But it's still able to be as reliable, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Because it's good because it comes back and says, you know, if you're scoring between this and this, you know, chances are you don't have depression. If you're between this and this, you know, it looks like you're kind of getting into that spectrum. And between that and that, yes, it's confirmed. So mm -hmm. it's really good how it gives women that kind of, oh, okay. Even if I think that when women get to the point of having, you know, full-blown postnatal depression, most of them realize it. They just know they're not right. You know, they just, mm -hmm. um, and and obviously if things ever go on to postnatal psychosis, I mean, that's that's rare and that's uh, far more complicated mm -hmm. and, and women oftentimes don't even realize 
you know they you know that i was saying crazy people don't realize they're crazy and they they're doing some really extreme behavior and they which makes sense to them at the time but i think with with sort of that run-of-the-mill depression mm -hmm. women oftentimes just know they're not quite right and when you do that questionnaire and you sort of fall in that middle spectrum that you're saying hey bit of a red flag that's a great moment for them to go okay yeah this is th this is something I should be addressing um sure. we've had um uh, I certainly have had in my career quite a lot of success with some of the with many of the naturopathic um herbal tinctures which often have, have been very effective rather than going straight to pharmacological drugs mm -hmm. which always have mm -hmm. side effects you know and things like 5-HTP, Siberian ginseng, go to cola, ginkgo biloba you know those herbs that have been around for literally thousands of years and used to um, for lots of things but particularly uh, you know mental depression um, have oftentimes been just all that's needed you know just to mm -hmm. put things back um, you know into that uh, balance equilibrium yeah. of sort of homeostasis have you seen much going on you know in other locations around integrative medicine um, or is it still very pharmacological place it's like you can have either nothing or you know a, a drug is not a lot i think the on. problem is when when women are going through that it, uh the screening process is so quick that um they don't really get to the bottom of the, the healthcare providers they don't really get to the bottom of what is actually is it actually uh a mental health problem that has been sitting or it's caused by the you know uh, you know pregnancy and all that so uh it's proper okay. intervention starts from you know what is the cost right and to be able to know yeah. which to address and so a lot of people have been giving diagnosis that they have no business to you know about you know like you know they've been diagnosed on what, what is not meant to be for them right so I, I think um that's why i said it both the providers and, and the people they are providing care for need to be well informed of what they're doing to be able to you know um provide the right um you know medication whether they have to go to medication i would what what research finding I've seen is that you don't jump into pharmacology, right? That's why it took so long for pharmacology to even like it was just it's first of its kind in the states, the, the medication that is run alone. It was just um, approved in um, August of this year by the FDA, right? It, yeah, it was first of its kind. They'd be asking for the oral, like I mean, there's an uh, inter um, intravenous um, route, but this is the first oral of its kind that, but again, it's already posing so many problems too. It can cause the the blood brain barrier, cause confusion. And you know, the whole thing is then, <laughs> it just compounded, you know? <laughs> so why do we want to go chemical? Why can't we just start, let's, let's start from, you know, the basics. And what we've seen is that diets goes a long way. You know, having proper balanced diet goes a long way, rest. You know, rest, sleep, exercise. It releases those natural hormones that, um, you know, that would just um, subtle all those, um, you know, take out all the, you know, um, uh, you know, toxic um, chemicals out of your body and then, and, and, you know, boost your, um, what's it called, antioxidants in you and all that. So it, it's it's very important. Um, specifically, I know one research finding was saying about um, riboflavin, uh, uh, which is uh, vitamin, vitamin B2. You know, if you can get those things that, uh, they're natural stuff that could be used as well. So don't let us all, always go to chemical at the initial phase. But, yeah. but the first approach is to to screen properly and have a full understanding of what is going on. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Adiola, for your time today. It's been really great. Do you want to, uh, just as we wind up, uh, just go over your contact details perhaps in case anybody would like to get in contact with you and anything else you'd like to close on today. Yeah, I think I really want to put the message out there to start with. This is very dear and very important to me that um, postpartum depression should not be left to women alone, right? It's a big deal. And then um, if women have to go through all that, and then you are even being, you're telling them not to talk about it, 
I mean, that's even very, <laughs> that that's quite unfair, you know, for them to deal with, right? And then men should never think they are, um, they are exempted from it as well. They are not, you know, you better start looking out for start screening all that. And for me, um, I, I could be rich on um on LinkedIn. You know, my name is Adiola Lauren Show. I don't think I wrote out my um, I don't have that on my slide, but on LinkedIn for sure, I'm I'm just right there as just the way the name appears. I believe people could see the name, right? Um, are people able to see my name actually? Um, just the way it is. Yes. It could be typed on LinkedIn and then yeah. I oh, the right. same thing on yes. yeah so, on so LinkedIn, so same thing on contact you that way. Yes, right. On okay. social media, every social media channel. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on um Facebook, I'm on um Instagram, yes, and uh I also have a uh what's it called a telegram um platform where it's called Mata Mental and we talk about matana and non matana health related issues you know my goal is to impact the the world across not just on mental health not just on maternal alone but even non maternal health issues that could affect people globally that's that's my goal yeah fantastic well thank you so much and thank you again to our, our live audience as well we always love the live ones here and uh and i would appreciate lots of people watch these things afterwards as well and uh yeah so thank you very much uh for your time uh, Adela, and uh, I just want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of the day and rest of their week. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye, Adiola. See you. Bye. Thank you for having me. Thank you.